Uh, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, my name is John Hallway. I'm the executive director here at the Quattrone Center for the Fair Administration of Justice. And uh, on behalf of my colleagues, Paul Heaton, and my other colleagues at the Quattrone Center and the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys and all of my colleagues here at Penn Law, welcome back for day two of our, the fifth Innovation in Prosecution Summit. Um, we had a terrific day yesterday. Uh, and I just wanted to start off by kind of touching on some of the themes that, that, that I thought came out of the various talks yesterday, and then I'll introduce our distinguished uh, keynote speaker. So, um, you know, I, I thought today, that yesterday was a pretty, a pretty fascinating day and a day where a lot of thoughtful prosecutors who are embracing the evolving and changing role uh, had some very insightful things to say. Um, Dan Satterberg from uh, King County on the West Coast started us off with, I thought, a really great challenge. And the challenge was to face up to the realities of the societal changes we're going through and the uh, conditions of you know, long-term racial imbalances uh, that, that our communities have faced and are, and are increasingly voicing, not to back away from that or avoid those difficult conversations because they are very difficult conversations, but actually to engage with our community, engage with our employees, the assistants in an office, the other members of the community, uh, and to recognize that the power of the office allows prosecutors some, some leeway to push the envelope, to, to try new things, and to embrace the role of social justice engineer that goes beyond the role of law enforcement officer. Uh, and and to, to do things, I think the way you put it, Dan, was to do things that make you feel a little uncomfortable uh, and not to, not to shy away from that. And I thought as a, as a way to kick off the day, that was a great challenge because a lot of the com things that we're talking about are really complicated uh, and, and challenging and complex tasks. Um, and the idea of not just getting the right guy in the right way, but doing all that and now making sure we do something useful with that person to reduce crime and the added complexities that bring to the job requires that kind of uh, transparency, uh, forward-looking behavior, and leadership. Um, the, uh, in order to do that, I think one of the themes that came up was that prosecutors need more information and the, the quest for data uh, and the ways to use that data and the sources of that data need to come from beyond uh, the prosecutor's office a lot of times. Uh, DA John Chisholm talked about how prosecutors are, uh, you know, may, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe not willingly, but nonetheless in the public health business as well as being in the prosecution business. Dan, you talked about we're dealing with neurochemicals uh, and, and we have a lot of people in our communities who are injured and, and struggling, and law enforcement, both police and prosecutors, are put in positions that they didn't expect to be in when they took the job to try and deal with those people with compassion uh, and individuality and, and, and provide justice in that realm. And to do that, you need new kinds of information. And so I liked Rod Underhill's, I mean, it's a bad acronym, but I like the concept of PAVRON. Uh, professional, and by the way, he said it was a bad acronym. I'm not being critical here. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't mean it was a good acronym. So professional judgment, accountability, victim input and impact, risk assessment, offense information, meaning information about the, the things charged, uh, and a needs assessment. And that all that information needs to come together to provide the kind of support for the members in our community who are committing crime that looks at the underlying reasons that cause them to commit crime because very few of the people that we deal with in our communities are truly evil. And so trying to figure out how to help those people avoid criminal behavior uh, is, a, is an important um, way to move forward. Um, theme number two, I think, prosecutors are not in this alone and can't do this alone. Um, we talked about ways that prosecutors and defense attorneys can reach across the aisle and collaborate on projects, whether it's conviction integrity units uh, and their work, um, or, uh, or the things like the Treatment First program that Rod Underhill talked about, which includes an assessment, a pretrial assessment, where uh, the, the, the defendant in a case represented by counsel sits down and answers some very direct questions about what that person, what, what assets, what support might help that person uh, deal with their addiction, and that information has to be carefully managed and corralled, and, and Rod spoke, I think, very eloquently about the trust that's required between prosecutor and defense attorney to enable that kind of process, and how do we build that trust in an adversarial system, and I think that, that challenge is something that we'll have um, in other contexts. 
Another uh, place in which prosecutors will have to collaborate is, of course, with judges. And we talked about some of the challenges of working uh, with courts and with judges and, and in the context of risk assessment. And um, you know, I want to quote Niels Bohr, the physicist, who said, predictions are very difficult, especially when they're about the future. Right? And, and if you think about it, that's what a risk assessment tool is trying to do. And we talked about how um, the question really is, is judge plus tool making better decisions than judge alone, right? Risk assessment tools are not salvation. Uh, they're an asset to be used in decision making. Uh, and we also learned, and this is very important on the operational side, we learned from Jeff Bingham in Spokane that for God's sake, you should get a color printer if you're going to print out color graphs and ask judges to make decisions about it. There is a tool, by the way, that you can use to make triangles or squares or circles so that even if you don't have the color printer, we can discuss that later. I can show you guys that if you need it. Um, theme three, funding is important to success. And we heard from a number of prosecutors the use of their offices in conjunction with county boards and defense attorneys and other members of the system to petition for funds to, 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 to enable some of these programs. And when you're reaching out to social organizations to use funds to make sure that people are employed to implement the solutions that we're proposing and that we're testing, um, we heard from, uh, from the Manhattan DA's office that really all you need is $808 million um, in, in forfeiture funds, and you can make all sorts of great things happen. I mean, all, if you just triple the endowment of the law school. Think about the good we could do. So I would invite all of you to send that money our way. Um, but, but more seriously, the work with county boards and other stakeholders to fund diversion, uh, treatment, and engagement programs, uh, things like the universal screening program that we talked about, uh, in Milwaukee, that requires collaboration to design and execute. And once you have that collaboration in multiple agencies, it's much easier than to go to a county executive or other budgetary authority and try to bring those funds in to support that program. And we heard uh, something from Drew Findling from the NACDL that I've heard some very enlightened prosecutors say as well, which is, if you really want to improve the quality of prosecution, fund public defense. Right? This is an area where the adversarial nature of the system actually makes us better. And we are better able to use the adversarial nature of the process to find truth if we have equal funding in the prosecutor and defense roles. That makes each side more able to uh, serve their role in the system of criminal justice. Uh, so we then talked about. Uh, officer-involved shootings and the Pennsylvania DA Association's approach to that. And what was interesting about that to me was how different the various jurisdictions are in the way that they handle some of these issues. They're complex, they're emotional issues. The community is very invested in them. There's lots of attention given to them. They require uh, immediate assessments, independence, and transparency. They require sensitivity for the victim and the victim's family, but also for the officer uh, and officers involved, uh, and certainly all the other officers in the department are watching very closely how this gets handled, and they're interpreting that message in terms of how you're going to take care of them. In, uh, in the transportation and safety literature, we have a, a, an expression called the second victim. And in aviation, the second victim is uh, the air traffic controller who sends a plane on a particular trajectory that then uh, results in an accident. And it's important to understand that that person is suffering from a trauma as well. And when we look at officer-involved shootings, understanding that there's a trauma that affects our officers and their colleagues, as well as the victim, the victim's family, and the community, makes this a very complex inquiry. Um, and, and how we deal with that, the transparency with, with which we deal with that, but also the sensitivity and compassion with which we, we deal with that for all parties is going to be how we're judged moving forward. Today we're going to shift gears a little bit, and we are going to continue to talk about the prosecutor-police relationship. Uh, in particular, we'll talk about body-worn cameras, which uh, bring a lot of these same issues to the fore about transparency, how are they being used, what should be released to the public, when and how, how do we store all that footage in the meantime, and we're going to talk about um, recording of interrogations. And in the background for the afternoon is why are these topics important? Well, they're, in they're important because the way we think about the Brady rule and exculpatory information uh, is shifting. Um, Vanessa Antoon from the uh, NACDL said yesterday that the rule is anything exculpatory must be disclosed, and materiality is a review standard, not a disclosure standard. And I actually agree with that, but it's not clear to me that that's universally believed uh, among you know, prosecutors and defense attorneys across the country. Uh, and one of the things that, that we've said for a while here is that, you know, Brady's been on the books since 1963, so it's a 55-year-old case. 
And we continue to have these conversations about when are things material, what's materiality, when does it get applied. And again, I'll go back to the transportation literature to Chris Hart, who used to run the NTSB. And Chris said, how many times are people going to have to trip over a step before you stop saying everybody's clumsy and you fix the step? Right? So when are we going to fix the Brady standard? Because if we're still having fights about what it means 55 years in, I don't think it's the people. I think it's the standard that's the issue. And so we'll talk about in one of our breakouts about the Michael Morton Act, which is how Texas has tried to solve that problem. They've tried to codify Brady, make it clearer, make it more objective. Uh, and we'll hear from Bill Worski, who lives in what he calls a post-Brady world in which everything has to be turned over all the time. Uh, but the federal courts are making things interesting, too, with decisions like Alvarez versus Brownville, where they talk about whether there is an obligation to turn over Brady material if the plea bargain that you are securing occurs before the discovery deadline. So think about that. You know you have exculpatory information. You haven't been told that you have a discovery deadline, and now you can get a plea bargain. And what's the role there? And it turns out we've got a circuit split, and so we can have that conversation this afternoon as well. Now, the police context uh, happens in other, in other areas, too, such as whether we should be uh, gathering lists of police who have been subject to disciplinary actions. And uh, is that something that you're living with at all? <laughs> so litigation was filed in the city of Philadelphia on that very issue. Uh, and, uh, and so it's a topic uh, of, of, of immediate uh, urgency. Um, now, urgency is not something that academia is known for. Um, but my daughter gave me a, a clock, and the clock hangs in my office, and at every section where there would be a number on the clock, my daughter bought me a clock that says, now. And that could be because she's a 17-year-old, and that's kind of the responsiveness she expects from me. Um, but I like to think that she gave it to me as a reminder that the work we do is really important, and the fact that, um, uh, that there are people in need all the time, and there needs to be urgency in what we do. And so I was thrilled not only when D.A. Krasner agreed to come speak, but at the title of his talk, The Urgency of Now. Now, I don't know actually what he's going to say other than that, so it may be that I've completely set him up for something that he's not going to, you know, different, but, but, but I'm going to go with mine, right? The urgency of now. The work we do is really important. It's great to have uh, this group of people and the thoughtful discussion we've had. Uh, look forward to more of it today. And so I'd like to briefly introduce Pennsylvania's 26th district attorney, uh, Lawrence S. Krasner, um, who attended public school in St. Louis and Philadelphia before going and getting an undergraduate degree at the University of Chicago and a law degree from Stanford, uh, and uh, where he was on the law review. Um, he uh, received multiple offers of employment in prosecutors and defenders offices throughout the country, but came to Philadelphia uh, where he worked as a public defender from 1987 to 91. Uh, and then in the Federal Public Defender's Office, 91 to 93. Uh, in 93, he started his own private practice, specializing in criminal defense and police misconduct matters, uh, and has remained in private practice since then, trying thousands of bench and jury trials in criminal and civil court in the Philadelphia area, as well as in other counties and states. Uh, throughout his career, he has proudly demonstrated a steadfast commitment to social justice, uh, has, he's defended protesters pro bono who were involved with movement, movements including ACT UP, Black Lives Matter, the progressive clergy with power, Casino Free Philadelphia, DACA, Dreamers, Decarcerate Pennsylvania, uh, he, Heeding God's Call and anti-gun clergy, uh, and others. Uh, he's lived in Philadelphia for over 30 years. Uh, his wife has been a judge on the Court of Common Pleas for 17 years, and they have two adult sons. Uh, and we're absolutely thrilled to have him here today uh, kicking us off and uh, leading what I think is going to be a great conversation for the rest of the day. Mr. DA.